Poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, 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 my friend, to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Brad Wilson. And today's guest on the show is high-stakes mixed game legend, who basically needs no introduction, Ellie Alezra. But just because the man doesn't need an introduction doesn't mean he isn't going to get one anyway. Ellie has led quite the life on and off the felt, and he's about to take you way back to the very beginning of his poker career. He's going to start with his time in the Israeli army and then travel through working in a cannery and driving a taxi in a small Alaskan town, where after terrorizing the citizens of said tiny Alaskan town at the poker tables, Ellie decided to test his mettle and see what the card players in Vegas were all about. As it turns out, those Las Vegas regulars like Doyle Brunson, Chip Reese, and Stewie Unger were pretty decent at playing cards, and Ellie's early trips did not go so well. Never one to be easily deterred, the poker bug had sunk its sharp little teeth into Ellie and was not going to let go. Despite doing very well for himself financially in his time in Alaska, Ellie got a surprising phone call and offer from his brother that would forever change the course of his life. In today's conversation with Ellie Alezra, you're going to learn the story behind Ellie's biggest winning and losing sessions, both are north of seven figures, what it was really like playing with legends like Stu Unger and Chip Reese, the origin story of legendary poker TV show High Stakes Poker, and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you the author of Pulling the Trigger, The Fearless and singular, Ellie Alezra. Ellie, good morning or afternoon. I, I'm not sure what time it is. Where, where are you at? 2 p.m., 2 p.m., Vegas, yeah. Oh, you're in Vegas. That's <laughs> that's easy. Minus five, minus three. It's 5 p.m. for me. It's <laughs> it's great having you on the show. I, I hope you? that you're doing very well and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to start out the show, I always lead with the first question, and that's to tell me about your poker journey. We may not even make it to question number two, because poker journey, I think for you, covers a quite a long period of time. And I'm sure there's some rich and great stories will drag out of you. So let's just start with how did you come across the game of poker? What year was that? And yeah, we'll start there. Well, uh, I start playing, I would say, people will, in my book, I just wrote my book, Pulling the Trigger, in English, I just wrote it, it was like high school bug, but in high school, I played just a little bit, and uh, I even lost, I was the guy that on charge of the money, I lost the money there. Oh. <laughs> Starting really playing, people thought that I play in my unit in the army, which is like the Green Beret over here, and they uh, it wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't play any poker in, in the four years uh, service in army. I started playing when I went to Alaska and I started. What, what brought you to Alaska from the army? What, what brought was, that about? I mean, that was the Lebanon war in Israel and I was a lieutenant and I was wounded. I actually literally broke my uh, ankle and I was on a cast and uh, I remember one of the officers tell us, oh, you can make good money on a fish in Alaska. And I knew I'm going to be down for four to six months. And uh, I figured that would be the best opportunity to me before I go back to the army to go make some money. As an officer in Israel, I made only $500 a month. This guy was talking about $8,000 a month, working in a cannery on a boat. And you know what? I think that I was uh, released, discharged, I, the day after I took a flight to London, London to Anchorage and Anchorage to this place, the village, it's called Bethel. And I start working immediately in a cannery. And then um, two months later, a little bit on a boat 
uh, fishing, you know, and I made not 8,000, I made more. I made 11, 12,000 a month. I walk 18 hours straight, which was nothing compared to the, you know, being in the Israeli army. And so now I made enough money. I still not poker. I flew to the far, I mean, uh, season, you know, over there, the ocean was frozen sometimes. I mean, the, the, in the winter. So I figure I'll take this money. I spend, a, I believe I save about 40,000. And then I took a trip in the Far East for about a year and with backpack and enjoy myself. And now I don't want to go back to Israel. Broke, you know, again, only 10,000. <laughs> so I go back to Alaska. And this time around, I figure... So I make so much money, uh, you know, one one of my teachers, uh, I was in English as a second language, language in one of the community college. He told me about this village with 3,000 uh, in, Inupak. Inupak is like Eskimo people, native. And he said he knows a cab company owner, which uh, he didn't take long because he showed me some of the slides over there and immediately... I said, would you please call him for me? He did. And the guy said, oh, from Jerusalem. And he was born again Christian. So he he, he, he invited me. I landed a week later in there. And I started driving a taxi. And I would say three months into driving a taxi in a small, small town that I knew within a couple of months, I knew everybody's names and everybody's house number. I become friends with few people. And then I got invited to a weekend poker game. And that's when the very first time I ever knew what is the version of the one that you're playing, start, start, the better, do to seven, all those games that I didn't know about. I knew about PLO, Omar, of course, the old them, but I didn't know about some limit game. And they taught me those games. And uh, the first day with the other taxi driver and some business people, I play only 12 hours. Then uh, I came another day in the weekend. I play another 12. The weekend after that, we just stay throughout the weekend. And, <laughs> and believe it or not, but I made more money. Driving a taxi, I made so much money. I made about $10,000 a month. And uh, one weekend, I make more than that playing poker. And how we call it in our uh, language? There was some fish out there, Yes. Yeah, they, you, you, you're a fisherman through and through. You went from <laughs> fishing, so fishing in Alaska to fishing, fishing the in your taxi village. driver. Yeah. So it was an amazing experience for me. First of all, I start learning something about myself. I that all of a sudden I got something that if if I know someone is have the middle pair and I can get him off with a big bet, stuff like that. That you know you have to read books, and I never read any poker books. And it took me, I think I was there about driving the taxi a year and a half. And I made so much money. And every, I would say, three, four months, I decided, okay, I'm good enough. I'll fly to Vegas. What so year now, was Alaska this? Alaska Airlines fly direct to Vegas. What, to what year, Courage. What so year was this, Ellie? What's that? What, what year was this? What year are we talking here? We're talking about 1980, 1984, 85, 86. Okay, so, yeah, I don't, I I don't remember those. Vegas in 87, yeah. <laughs> I was one year old in 1984, so. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, so, so time. I bought a ticket, cost me only $700, I remember, round trip to Vegas. And I think, oh, here we go, I'm going to play poker, I'm so good, I arrive. I landed, go straight to Stardust. Start playing and don't worry. Those guys with the jogging suit and stuff, they came and they cleaned me and I had to call to get some more money. I think I lost like 20000 on the first trip. Flew back to Alaska with my head down, make some money, come back again. I said, I'm going to get better. And every time they teach me the same lesson, you know, those guys <laughs> that I'm not good enough and I got a long way to go. So after being in Alaska those years, I, I think I make about three or four trips to Vegas. None of them was profitable. And then um, but, my brother-in-law... Could I, could I ask you a question yes. real quick? You're crushing in your village. You're making a lot of money playing against the cab drivers. You are make a lot of money fishing. Why were you so hell-bent on going to Vegas and making it in Vegas? It started right there. The adrenaline in your body, you want to be 
the best. You want to beat the best in this game. And I mean, something about this game, people telling me, you know, during the years that I own my businesses, I made millions of dollars in the businesses. And then I said, why do you need it? Because we are sick poker players <laughs> and we love it, you know. And some people will love to go shooting golf balls and love to do their travel. And I just love poker. And I love to sit in a, in a game and have the chat with the poker players. And you get to know so many players in, this, in our game and so many nice people. And uh, it's not like the, you know, in the old school, uh, before, I'm talking about before my 20s, anybody that play card game in Israel, I mean, it's a shame. My, your parents got upset at you. And what are you talking about? You have to have a job. You have to go, you know. And uh, I realized slowly, slowly, actually after the money maker era, I realized a lot more. But uh, before that, when I, I was playing with Chip and Doyle, immediately I realized this game got so much future. I knew right there that... Uh, but anyway, going back to... It's a good question. Why are you trying to be them when you make money? Maybe one of the excitement and one of those things that you really want to prove that you probably can beat other people. And of course, it didn't work. It didn't work. Some people don't admit it, but I admit when I'm beat. I know when I cannot, you know, beat other players and stuff. So, you know, this village that you call it, it's called Katsibiu. It's 30 miles above the Arctic Circle. You don't expect people from there to know too much about poker. So, I mean, that's why it was the easiest way for me to build my confidence. So going back to five years, I mean, after three years, my my partner, which is my brother-in-law, arrived to Alaska to work in this uh, taxi business. And when he arrived, he stayed only for two and a half years. And he said, I'm done with six-month light, six-month dark, frozen <laughs> and stuff. And he came with my sister and the two kids, you know? To make the long story short, when he finished after two and a half years, he said, I'm going to Vegas. From Vegas, I'm going to Disneyland and back to Israel, back to Jerusalem when we were born. When he arrived to Vegas, he didn't have a place to stay. He, he didn't know Vegas is so busy. So he was sitting there and he saw films developing 60-minute business. He go and approach the guy and the guy was speaking, you know, he's a Jewish guy that speak a little bit Hebrew, but he's, after conversation, the guy told him, I have the business for sale. He called me the next day. He said, why don't you get all the money we got together? Come down. He didn't have to say it twice. <laughs> for me, Vegas. So by then, we own also a little convenience store over there in Katsabu. I, um, I got it. I cut the next plan. I got here. I realized that there's opportunity over here. I said yes to him. We signed some paperwork. I go back to Alaska, got all the money together, sell what we have. And because of him, I actually start in Vegas. We start with a little apartment. We start with one store. And uh, five years later, we find ourselves uh, with about 25 stores, 25 locations for films develop. And then from films developing in 16 minutes, we become in 30 minutes. We bought so many labs. And then we become T-shirt places. And so I was so much in the business. And every weekend, I went to play poker and play all weekend. And that's where I into, got introduced to the Binion Horseshoe. And I went to play over there. And of course, I saw some of the legend over there. Uh, that's where I was playing with Stu Anger. And, uh, Did you know the, that they were legends back then? Was yes. that they, they I mean, were... right there, Dol Bronson, he was playing. But of course, I never approached them because I was playing with Scotty Noon, Scotty Baby, and with a few other players, the 153 and 100, 200, the, the 280 or better, probably one of your favorite games or something. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, um, unfortunately I have spent too much of my time specializing in no limit hold'em and haven't ventured out into the mixed game world, which makes me very sad about my poker career. But I think that like, as a, as a professional grinder, the one sticking point for me has always been that there's an opportunity cost in learning a different game when you know that you're beating your current game at a very high level. You don't play mixed game? Why did I thought you play mixed game? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe no, I just okay. look like a mixed game player. So you play um, only No Limit Hold'em. That's it. Not PLO either? I will play PLO. I haven't put as much time into PLO as I have Hold'em, but No Limit Hold'em and PLO are the two games that I feel 
very comfortable playing. I know I'm out of the subject. Sorry for the... No, 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 no. It's, it's good. How many, what is the highest? 25, 50, 50, 100? What is highest, the highest? No Limit Hold'em that I've played? Yeah. I've played 50, 100, No Limit Hold'em, uh, but only a few times for the most part. Pretty big. It's huge. That that's a big game, yeah. It's pretty big. Uh, I've played a lot of ten twenty and twenty forty at the Commerce. Those oh, are oh, that's very that's a big game too. I mean, the, the big game in Bellagio at the moment is the twenty forty. That's what they play all the time. Twenty forty eighty, I believe. Oh, that's really? Yeah. Next to us, yeah. And a lot of the games have gone private. I don't want to get. I, okay, sorry. I, I don't. Sorry. I, I, yeah, I'm I'm very easily led astray down a <laughs> down the down the path. Let's, no, we'll go back to the games and what yeah. you're doing and. The, Commerce and some stuff. Uh, I mean, to the ice stacks that uh, that's where I play the four and eight hundred. No yeah. limit. But anyway, so now we I'm uh, I'm back in uh, you know in the finish everything sold whatever come to Vegas and playing the weekend and slowly from the horseshoe day that I see those legend in other games I start playing in Stardust and from Stardust uh, there that's where I start learning the Raz game and. Uh, I see people playing stud, and then they build the mirage. And the mirage, I would say, that's where I jump a little, uh, start playing a lot of 75, 150 stud at the mirage. And uh, from 75, 150, I remember they start playing Howard Lederer, his sister, Annie Duke, David Gray, uh, the guy named Jay, he was the one that lost millions. He played with them 500 and 1,000 stud. And I did jump a few times into this game, and I realized it's pretty much fun, and uh, you probably know it <laughs> in your game, when you have one guy that literally give it away. It doesn't matter what. It's like Larry Flint, late Larry Flint, sorry. I play in his game, 2 and 4,000, and I play 4 and 8,000. Start. And when you have one guy that is the cow and that you keep milking it, everybody's basically having fun and celebrating. Yeah, because everybody's everybody's winning just based on that one player's loss. It's it's very easy to have a massive loss rate playing poker. It's much harder to have a really good win rate. And when you get somebody that just is is giving it away, it's you're just waiting for your turn. And everybody's a favorite, right? Exactly. So that's why I start playing the five and nine thousand. And our business is growing. I was working during the day and probably come three times a night only, three times a week. Were you and winning? I- I was a. Were you I winning was in these okay games? Okay, player. I wasn't losing yet. Okay. You know, I didn't do any major losses, but I start feeling, oh my god, I can literally make two, three thousand dollars a night sometimes. And they, but I wasn't managing. I can tell you, I did not manage correctly. I didn't have anybody to teach me how to manage. So now, all of a sudden, we get one day. Uh, Bobby Baldwin decided that to move the games to the Bellagio. And it doesn't matter if we want to stay at the Mirage, he moved the game to Bellagio. And, <laughs> I mean, you know that Mirage was amazing for me. It was amazing for my wife, too. She was playing machine, and she was playing big machine, and she was winning two, three million dollars on the machine this year. And I won, I won my poker, uh, Mirage Poker Showdown. How? Um, how is your wife winning millions on a machine? That's she played the five dollars machine and she keep hitting jackpot after jackpot. I mean, we paid a lot of taxes that year, that year, just for that. And by the way, that was the only year I can tell you. <laughs> since then, <laughs> since yeah. then, nobody can win in machine. I'm sorry. Yeah, but this particular year we pay, and then I won my Mirage Poker Showdown, and now I won a million dollar in a game. You know, in in in, and that was my first tournament that. My kids was kind of laughing because they saying, Dad, you keep saying that you're playing poker, but we never see you on TV. Yeah. And and that's when the late Mike Saxton, when he introduced me, he said, you have to say a couple of words. So I look at the TV and I said, guys, you know, I have five kids. Kids, see, I'm still playing poker. I'm here. <laughs> I won one. Uh-huh. And I don't have to tell you, when you win in No Limit, you really feel like you're an untouchable. So I would say two, three years later, I flew to every tournament there is i go to aruba and i go to this and i go and i did not i have some caches you know i'm not one of those big tournaments that can show big i have over three million dollar life winning but it's not like a i immediately i learned that the tournament is as tough as they come you know you have so many good players and not as good as those days 
not as good as the GTO of those days. I mean, back then there was, I mean, uh, I'm an old school. In my games was a bet, two bet, three bet, all in. There wasn't too many, you know, four bets and five bets and things, you know, and uh, only double raise and all those things that I, I didn't know about all those things. Nobody so did. Course, of course, I got lucky in this Mirage and I won it. And now Bobby Baldwin decided to move us. So we moved to Bellagio. And well, then, when you say Bobby Baldwin decided to move you, is he like organizing the game and putting no. it together at Mirage? How did he no, move Bobby it? Bobby Baldwin is the, was the president of the Mirage. Steve Wayne, he was Steve Wayne kid, basically. And Steve Wayne brought, brought, bring him to, to run the Mirage for him. And when they built the Bellagio, he's the one that built the Bellagio. So he became the president. And he was, then after that, he became the CEO of, the, of all the MGM group and everything. But when he says something, he says something. Now, Bobby is also a poker player. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I play with Bobby several times, but, you know, they have the rule that, uh, you know, the executive cannot play in their own casino. So then we went and played in Sam's Clubs a couple of times and stuff. But when Bobby's saying, we're going with it. So now that's when we arrived to Bellagio, they didn't have a Bobby's room yet. And if I have to put the ear on it, it was 1990, 89 or 90. And uh, right there when I start playing high, I think that's when the, it's tip basically because I saw next to me, they playing Chip and Doyle and the group playing one in 2000. Uh, and then I came in and the Chip in, introduced himself very nice as a beautiful businessman. And he knew that I'm a businessman and he knew that I'm sick and I love poker. It didn't take long that we become friend, poker friend. And and then I start playing every day. Every day playing the mixed game with them, five days a week, six days a week. Less concentrate about tournament. Maybe back then I play a little bit to the World, uh, the world Series at the Horseshoe, but those are, uh, it wasn't as popular, you know? So I concentrate more on the cash game and that's why I fell in love with the cash game. And I've done very well at the beginning. And when we raise the limit, I mean, when we play only three, four in and with Chip and Doyle, I've done really good. I, uh, I, I cashed so much money and I, and then when the game fill up, I start to realize that's where my weakness is because I'm, I like to play a lot more hand and the game fill up. You have to be more selective and I wasn't and, Make the long story short, when we start playing very high, four and eight thousand, I start seeing huge losses, and I never manage. And one of my biggest loss I wrote in my book was one point three five million. I lost it in about thirty some hours. I never got sleep. My mind wasn't even clear. I was playing so many hands, and finally, after thirty some hours, my wife threatened me that if I'm not coming, she's going to come and make a scene. So I left the table. And uh, tell me, what, yes. what's what's going through your mind? What are you feeling as you're getting buried more and more in this four thousand, eight thousand game over the course of thirty hours? Like, what does the internal dialogue sound like? It's an amazing, amazing question, and amazing the down the biggest down feeling in my life. I when I drove home, I have to lower the window down and put some water on my face not to fall asleep. I'm only 15 minutes from my house and talk on my, to, with my wife. But then when she hang up the phone, I look at the mirror and I look at myself and, and I really talking to myself, literally. I'm sure you find yourself talking to yourself after a big loss when you didn't know that after the second bullet, this is not your day. It doesn't matter what you do. And of course, I didn't know. And I keep pulling another 200, another 200, another 200. And uh, I, I, I said to myself, how stupid, what the biggest donkey. I mean, why did I need it? My parents work all their life. My father, he was post office. And my mom is a kindergarten day, daycare teacher. They never make this money all their life and I have to lose it. And of course, my bankroll wasn't good enough for me to lose this kind of money. So, who's is? <laughs> That's right. Steve Wynn, maybe? Uh, maybe Guy yeah. Lala I mean, just Guy, Guy, yeah, definitely Guy. But, uh, you know, I think that even, you know, us, the, the human being or the, the, the poker player that you call ourselves the animal of the poker player, you would think that, oh, here we go. You learn your lesson. No, don't worry. 
down the road, two, three months, four months, you forget about it. Then you get bury yourself. I bury myself. I think we flew to Tunica after that. And I lost in Tunica. We flew private for the first time. Me and Doyle and, and Jack Binion took us in cheap. And then I, Jack Binion asked us, come and play the, we have the main event over there. So $10,000 main event. And it was What the whole show in Tunica. Yeah. So now I flew. We arrived. It was like 10.30. He said, let's go play. Lyle, for some reason, we said we'll play two and four thousand. Lyle, Berman decided to keep it, kick it up to four and eight. Don't worry, eight hours later, I was stuck 550 or 600. And it was like two or three a.m. And the next morning, you're supposed to play a tournament. And everybody quit me. So <laughs> now I go upstairs. I have, a, I have a couple of glasses of wine with my wife. And I said, I don't think. And then they wake me up the next day. I say, fuck this tournament. I'm not playing <laughs> no tournament. I, I need to win first prize to be able to, to break even. And uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, we don't remember. We don't have the, 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 the sense of you put yourself on the fire one time. You hurt yourself. Don't do it again, you know. Just use the common sense. And, of course, I've done it many times. And that's where also when I also made mistakes and borrowed money and did some, a lot of mistakes in my life, which I admit. And, and I mean, right now, I mean, to people that want to know, uh, I'm playing very cheap. Three and 600, four and 800, two and 400. The most you can win and lose per night is between 20 to 40,000. And uh, it's not a lot. Some, sometimes people even take a pieces of me and I'm doing okay now, you know? And, uh, For the people that listen, and I was crying until now, I have a big win. One of my biggest wins is 1.86 million in eight hours. I play with Johnny Ward, Sammy Faha, Ted Forrest, Jennifer, and Chow. I think that when I left home after those eight hours, <laughs> I was thinking that no one can play better poker than Elliot yeah, Lesnar. You are the no king. One. Yeah, I mean, this is, I'm the best poker player in the world, and my box was full, and that was during the time that the banker was in town. So not only the money, we were if, if full boxes because the banker, we also, I also won one of my biggest wins. So talking about up Andy, and down for poker player is amazing. You, you're talking about Andy Beal from, yes. uh, from Texas, the Beal Bank that was immortalized in Michael Craig's The Professor Banker Suicide King, which is one of my all-time favorite poker books. Amazing like, book, yeah. I, this is a little, I'm a little sheepish saying this on, on my show, but I don't necessarily love poker strategy books. Um, I, I'm not drawn to them. What I'm drawn to are the stories. Like that book, just one of my favorites. Doyle wrote a book forever ago. I don't even know what the name of it was, but it was like a bunch of short stories about people playing cash games. And like, that was one of my favorite books of all time. Um, I loved Amarillo Slim's book um, that, you know, I, I think all the stuff that happened with him, it, it doesn't get talked about, but like Amarillo Slim in a world full of fat people. That was a book that I, I love the stories about, you know, that scene back in the eighties. I mean, that to me, that's, uh, those people are like the larger than life heroes that, I look up to just as a poker player. You know what I mean? I'll tell you what, I'll add up the two, my two cents on the books. So I never wrote, a, I never read a poker book, okay? And not only that, I, my English is not as, I, I can read book, I can read English, but it's not as, so when I open uh, books like Doll's book and I see all the, if you raise before the flood, the percentage in this and you're showing this, this is the most boring things in my life. So, Now, when Doyle wrote, when I played first time with Doyle, he gave me the, the, the system, how do you call it? The Doyle's book? Um, super system. Super system. So he gave me the super system too. And then he wrote something, and I didn't know what he wrote. I put it in the side, and I, you know, I said, I'll take it home, and I'll put it in my shelf. <laughs> when I got home, when I got home, it was like three years after I met Doyle, or four years, I opened it, and he said, To my friend Eli, he called me Eli. Everybody called me Eli because Doyle. <laughs> my friend Eli, I don't think you should read this book. It's going to ruin your game. <laughs> Love Doyle. <laughs> so I still got it. It's, it's one of the best things that I got. But I'm like you. I enjoyed so much Barry Greenston, you know, Ace on the River. Because Barry 
talk about people and less about strategy, less about this. I mean, I tried to read Gus's book when he wrote about the Australian, the Melbourne, when he won the tournament. It's too much for me, just too much. And then I read Mike Saxton, the late Mike Saxton, the stories. is That's what you like. The betting on the golf course and what's going on and the story about this tour. And so many good, that's what I like about Poker Book. And when I wrote mine, I wrote about my life. Born in Jerusalem, grew up, being in the army, almost get killed, going to Alaska. From Alaska, I, I, a little bit about poker, you know, and, and, and mostly about the players over there, you know? Yeah. What I did on high stakes poker and all this. So, okay, we kind of <laughs> got out. For, no, it's fun. I don't even know where we were. I don't know where we were either, but I would say <laughs> one thing that came to mind when you were talking about playing shorthanded, um, talking about putting pressure on people with middle pair, and also not reading super system and not really being attracted to like the poker strategy books of the day. And it's a thing that I've thought a lot about as it relates to poker skill sets and, you know, aggressive players, players that put pressure on people. The one thing that they do that makes everything else almost insignificant is the ability to read human emotion and understand when, what somebody's threshold of pain is and then moving beyond that. And would you say that that's a, a skill that you have personally used in your poker journey? Absolutely. I also watched because I learned it on myself playing with people that, you know, that the bank hole is short and they're playing sometimes the, uh, do you, uh, Mike Madison saying, Mike Madison saying uh, BOT bank hole on table Sometimes you can see that people playing with scared money and you can take advantage of it. You, you want to hear, hear a story that causes me shame to a little, a, a little bit of okay. shame, but a little bit of pride kind of mixed together. A friend okay. of mine, uh, back when I was probably 22 years old, a uh, guy that I really learned how to play poker with back in, you know, 2004, 2005 area. He had, <laughs> he only had, a few thousand dollars to his name. And he asked me to lend him the money so he wouldn't have to go back to the room and get it. In which case I said, okay. And 30 minutes later, him and I are playing and it's a table full of a bunch of fish and him and I play a pot. And like, I just, I remember knowing that it's his case money and (laughs) shipping the money in and just like in my head, I know he's not going to call. Like he he doesn't want to be oh involved God. with me. And like he just he t- tanked forever. I mean, he has maybe some of the highest level of poker talent that I've ever experienced in another human. He's tanking. Like it's almost like he knows what I'm doing and yet he can't pull the trigger. And so eventually <laughs> he just like shakes his head and slams his cards in the muck. One of the best and you didn't show him, I hope. I did. <laughs> I you showed him one it? card. I showed him one card. Oh, oh my so, God. So much shame. Uh, you know, people, people that listen to us, listening to us, that are beginners, poker players, or people that even regular mom and pop, it is very cruel what we're doing. I mean, in a way, it's unfair. You go after someone, you know, it's his case money. You're, doing, you're going after, but this is our business. This is our job. What can you do? They want to come and enjoy. Believe me, we're giving them a better chance than Blackjack and Baccarat. That's when my I, opinion. I mean, when, I was, young, in, whew, when I was young, when I was much younger, I was as cutthroat as it gets. I would tell everybody that listen, like, we're friends. I love you. I'll do anything for you. We sit down at the poker table. I'm going to fucking go after you with I everything I have. I mean, that was just, that was my policy. That's the way to do it. Very smart and very, very solid. I agree. So basically, yes, that's what I do in the poker table those days. And that's when I'm playing the shorthanded. I I believe my gut feeling skills, it's way higher. And of course, I did learn how to adjust myself. I think that uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, when I start playing lower, after I got spanked by the big limit player, I start picking up some stuff that I just don't want to be a dog to people so i will never sit with the with the sean deeb and doug park and uh, daniel nagano or whatever and phil i wouldn't f- sit down and play one game with them 
Now in ice tags, Morris Gennady is my friend. We play mix all the time and he, we're doing some. So he promised me when we're playing ice tags, once in a while, I won't get, when I see the lineup only Patrick Antonio, I won't see it, but he just called me and there is going to be filming the ninth and the 10th season together in May. I'm going to play it. And by the way, I didn't play poker the whole year. I, the 357 days, actually. I just played three days ago. I went to Aria. So that's because I got vaccinated. Both of them, I waited the 10 days. I got the Pfizer and you wouldn't believe it. I was like a kid that they sent to a candy store. I was so happy when I arrived there. Of course, I was a little disappointed. I had to wear the shield and the mask and between the screen, but I missed it. I miss it so much. I play for this year at the house. I play only online and only mixed game and only with people I know. We have this king side that you have to play with your own name. And that's, and I did okay. I did okay, but with all the respect, comfortable being playing with your pajama and playing online. And I don't know how you like it. I like to look at the face of people be, when I play. And uh, going back to this, yeah, I don't want to be a dog. I mean, Doyle wrote on his Twitter when Daniel started playing and they gave Daniel four and a half to one, they dog against Doug Park. And dog, Doyle wrote something of the very smart things. And I remember that he said, I will never, this, anybody want to come play me? I'll play my Raz game. You want to play one game? You have to put another seven game of mine. Because I don't want to be a big dog to these things, you know? Yeah. And if you remember, Doyle won 19 out of 20 sessions on the high stakes. And I learned this from him. I won five out of six seasons. Because the end of the day is whoever got the, the, the money in the table, who left with chips and who didn't. That's what counts in poker. Nothing else anymore. Oh, look at that. I bluff him. I put the bread booth, the $1 million bluff against Phil Ivey. I mean... We know where Phil Ivey and where Brad Booth is. Actually, nobody knows where Brad Booth is. I know. I, I think he got found. I, I think he did oh, they turn, found him? turn up. He did find. Okay, yeah. that's good. He's alive. I think so. At last <laughs> okay, I checked, good. yeah. yeah. Because I see, but I, I mean, I learned this from Doyle. Just play ABC. I mean, why would I have a seat with Jason Marcia when I know that he's so good? Or I, the Jason Kuhn or so many good. When I watch some of those high stakes, it is a different level. You know, those guys are playing the high stakes poker and uh, it's just scary how good they are, you know? Now, if you put me in and said to me, you have to play them, of course I go with the attitude of going to win. But stuff that they've seen, many end that they've seen, I don't want to be a dog. I, put I'm anybody just... against me in a mixed game. I don't care who that will be. From the Phil Ivy to this, I'll play anyone. But And, and I know I got as much chance to win as much as chance that they are but no limit is tough or i i i'm gonna do some speculating here that the listener do not take this to the bank because i don't know the situation behind the scenes but the doug polk negrani thing was very odd to me it was a very weird thing that happened i didn't understand why it happened because like you said daniel daniel really didn't have much of a chance. I mean, he's taking, he's playing a specialist at the specialist's own game who has been playing heads up, no limit at the highest of levels for like a decade. And so what was curious to me, my speculation is that somehow or another, like GG poker helped behind the scenes um, as it relates to like selling action for that challenge. And that's the only thing that makes sense to me because Daniel's not a, a stupid person, right? Like Daniel not knows, Daniel knows he's business savvy. He's smart. So I feel like there were some, you know, ways that he mitigated the risk before taking on the challenge. But again, it's pure speculation and I have no like inside source. That's just what my intuition tells me because that's the only thing that makes sense to me. You know, Daniel, I love Daniel. Daniel, when I was playing big, he was coming sweating Jennifer as a little young kid that just started playing the game. And he is, for me, there's no better ambassador to poker than Daniel. He's so good. He's good to the audience. He's good to, you know, I've been his friend for so long. He even suggested a few times stuff to me, you know. And, and I was, when he was playing the game, I tried to think if it's, how smart is Doug Park? 
that keep poking him, poking him. As the, you know, and the, you remember the exchange on Twitter and he was very dirty about the, 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 his wife, Daniel's wife and stuff. And I didn't like it. I didn't, there's, you know, there's, Doug Pock can do a lot of things people don't like, but over here he was, he did something that really got him the, the, the million dollar, the million two. Yeah. And some other people bet side bets and stuff like that. And so you might be right. You might be right that Daniel is not that stupid. And I know few people take piece of Daniel. You know why? Because poker player, when they see four to one out there, they jumping on it. People don't understand how big it is. It's a huge. And both of you playing, but you know, I I play the NBC heads up a few times. I came only I think I play five times and I only twice make it to the third or whatever, fourth level. And it's a completely different game. Completely. When you have to play the Jack 5 of suit, I don't care what people said. You have to adjust your brain to play bad hands. Yeah, I, and- I, I did commentating for it, and I'm just like, I'm, I, I'm not as heads-up specialist. This game is just foreign to me everybody's got way too many hands like I, I don't know how this is supposed to look uh because it's not my area of expertise and you know no matter how smart you are and naturally talented which you know poker's a meritocracy and daniel has built his legacy on his skills at poker it's really hard to switch to somebody's specialty over a short period of time and and battle them it's it by really hard I think it's just impossible. Daniel is such an amazing player when you read people. I mean, before we jump to Daniel Reed and Ice Stakes, I tell you the, the 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 match coming up now. I think seven minutes after Daniel tweet to Phil Almuth, I hear you talking shit about me. Why don't you come and sit down? I wrote on my Twitter, that will be a match for the ages. <laughs> you know, you guys should do... And immediately, I mean, Brent, Brent Hanks and this called me and said, you want, we want to interview, we want to ask you. I said, listen, both of them, my friend, and both of them good players, and both of them old school, as much as Phil is more old school than Daniel, I mean, uh, I don't want to predict, but, you know, no one can put Phil. Dole said it in one of the best ever. Every World Series that we play, Dole advertise outside, if anyone want to put his money against Phil, even money against Phil Almut and any Oldham event, shop is open. And people used to come and bet 25000 50000 and they just named the event. Don't worry, Doyle made all the money. So, I mean, we know Phil Almut doing something amazing. Yeah, I... I, I'm I'm not immune. I, I've taken Phil's been on the show. He's a great guy, very generous. If if I send him an email, he replies like instantly. Like I don't know. Oh, that's he, nice. He's 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 a really good, generous, genuine guy. And you know, I've made a couple of cracks about Phil Hellmuth and the blow ups and like um all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I, I had a conversation with Phil Galfond. He was on the show and I, I said something and Basically, it was when somebody, when you don't understand what a high level player is doing, and yet you know that they've had great results over time and they're not just clicking buttons, that there's a method behind whatever thing they're doing that doesn't look right or doesn't feel right. Like it, it's just because you don't know what's going on. And that's an area that you should probably investigate and learn more about because something, ha- something is happening that you're not aware of it happening. And Helmuth is like the perfect example of this. And Galfond tweeted out a little while later, and I'm not going to say that he stole my line, but I'm going to say that I'm going to say that he stole my line. He he said that like <laughs> Phil Helmuth like ha- is successful all the time. Everybody makes fun of him, but maybe it's just that Phil knows things that other people don't really understand, and maybe instead of making fun of him, we should investigate what he's doing right. Oh, so I that remember we- that. I remember what he tweeted. Yeah, yeah, it was a very nice compliment for Phil. It was, it was, and I, I'm 100% in agreement that we we should think about when we see somebody do something we don't understand, and they're a high level thinking player. Let's investigate why, because they have a reason. They're not just doing it to do it. Over and over and over the years, and the man's still there. So you want to tell me that I like his poker addict? No, I don't. I don't like the some of the stuff that he does. But for people like me old school professional, maybe like you too. When he see professional in front of him, he will try to put to put the cry baby thing, but he knows it doesn't work. It's worked very much on amateur. 
he can drive amateur to the ground and I've seen him doing it and he's professional. And no one in this poker world is better self-marketing himself than Phil. No, he I mean, played, Phil Hellmuth played the poker boom better than anybody else on the planet. Yes. Better than anybody. Um, I agree. Let's, I agree. So that will be an interesting match right there. Think about it. That'll yeah, be a very interesting match. I, I think it will. Um, and I, I, I am... Oddly excited to see what develops in that heads up match. It is two to one, they say. Phil is two to one dog. So, wow. I mean, I don't put money on stuff like that. I usually don't try to bet or whatever, but interesting. I mean, going back to Daniel, the sixth season I play with him in high stakes poker, I mean, everyone keep telling me people from Israel and people, why is this guy, Daniel, he knows what you have. He call your hand and he still call you. And we saw it so many times. At least, I would say 10 times with me, he said, I know you got that when I raise him big on the river and he still called me. So that's why Gleb Kaplan is laughing on his this couple of times. I mean, Daniel lost so much money on, the, on these games and he still was one of the best poker players out there. Reading the situation, knowing what's going on, understand the suit that connected like Tom Duan and... Uh, you know, some young people do, and this is uh, just uh, the what's, ice sticks. Yeah. What's the old expression that you not only know you you not only have to know how to play well, you act you also have to play well like that. So you you have to execute. It doesn't matter how much you know if you can't execute the strategy in the moment when it matters. It doesn't really mean very much. Absolutely, at the end of the day. absolutely correct. I've been, as I said, I play with Daniel so many times, and I, I just like, love him as a human being. And when I was down, he, he, he offered his help, you know, because we old school people, everybody think that we are untouchable. Everybody have his down moment. Everyone that been high stakes poker been broke several times. When I talk cash broke, that you can't even empty up, you know. Now, going back to this uh, high stakes, I mean, high stakes poker is what made me or what made me famous or whatever. I mean, I'll tell your audience like that. It started like that. We're playing in Bellagio. Maury is coming and approaching Chip and Doyle and say, guys, I want to film this movie. And Chip looked at him and said, what are you talking about? He said, not only did I want to film this movie, uh, this game, I want to film this game and I'm going to pay you guys $1,200 an hour for playing in it. Okay. And, Do- and Doyle asked him, and we can do whatever we want over here? He said, absolutely. I think two months later, we were at the Golden Nugget <laughs> playing our first match. And I've, you probably remember, first and second season, we played the props. And yeah. the props, it's so addicted. And I play with Doyle and them and stuff, and Phil Ivey and... and we realized, and Maury realized, that one mistake he made, he said, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> because when we sit down and Doyle got king seven in the hole and the flop came, Jack win three with the same suit. And Doyle said, I see it. You owe me 8,000. So everybody, I mean, the regular mom and pop don't understand what the heck is going on. And they, they didn't understand. Doyle won 20,000 because it was his diamond suit and... <laughs> Yeah. So I think that uh, Mori convinced us after the, in the middle of the second season to forget about the paper and forget about the prop and play poker, you know? Yeah. Even though I remember during full till days, Isadore, no Isadore, um, uh, uh, what is his name? The Phil Ivey and um, his name, the PLO player, very famous, the Swedish. Uh, he played. He played $50,000 black or red against Phil Ivey. I'll remember his name in a minute. But those are the prop that it's easy to explain. But the, Gabe Kaplan couldn't explain our own prop, <laughs> and it was confusing. Yeah. But, um, the, what, that's, the problem is, like, you, they need to be a little bit confusing. Oh, so Zygmunt. They, Zygmunt. Zygmunt. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Hillary Sahamias. Hillary, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the props need to be confusing so that there's the potential for somebody to sleep one so that you have you can have an edge, right? Like so they need right. to be a little bit complex. Doyle was sleeping a lot and we waiting usually. After the turn card is asleep. So the moment he sleep, we start laughing at him because <laughs> he's talking about tens of thousands of dollars if he sleeps. Yeah. So this ice takes what it did to me 
not only that he put me on the map and people all of a sudden knew who was Eli Eliezer, I remember flying and being in Greece in the airport and Italy and this, people come to approach and they try to get picture of me. And I said, come on guys, I'm not a superstar. <laughs> I'm only a card player, you know? But that was amazing though, during this time, what money might make her make to, to the era of being a poker player that everybody want to play poker. And I still call it sport. For me, it's a sport because everyone can play it. A lot of people can win it. And if you really study it a little bit and learning, you know, not all of us, all of them like me and you that cannot read Sklansky book, you know, people that can, can read David Sklansky book with all his, uh, you know, what you have to do with this and percentage, then they can probably pick up some good stuff from there, you know, and learn I, about the No Limit game. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And I, I want to go back a little bit because we're, okay. yeah, we, we've, we're in the Negranu Polk, but... Okay. Remember what's interesting to me, these stories, right? Like I, I want to ask you like back in the day, you know, you mentioned playing with Johnny World, Chip Reese, Doyle, obviously, Daniel, all of these killers. Um, who would you say that if they're on their A game, they're just the most terrifying player that you've played against? Okay, the, definitely Chip. Chip, I mean, you remember the very famous sentence from Chip. Everyone, everyone can play his A game when he's winning and he's up. You know, you know that a poker player, when we're winning, we feel good and we play good and we throw a lot. Yeah. But the trick is to play your A game when you're down. And that's, and Chip was on his A game when he was on tilt, when he was this, he was, so for me, he was one of the best. And not only that, let me tell you, because everybody says to anger, play with two anger 10 times. The man have a con- Completely control on the table. He did whatever he want. I play with him the year that he won, that the final table was in a, in, a, in Fremont Street over there, outside. And I remember playing with him for, I would think, eight hours. He just took control on the table. You know, when you raise every hand, he raised every hand, or I would say eight out of ten hands, and he knew when to fold. And all of a sudden, when you come on top of him, he have it. Or they let him see the flap, and they try to trap him, and he trap you. Just complete control and amazing, amazing. I was intimidated when I watched him. And then, of course, Chip did not play a lot of No Limit with me, so I don't. But then Phil Ivey jumped in. Phil Ivey, the very first time Phil Ivey played with us, it was Bobby's room, young kids coming. And I remember when he quit and he left, Chip turned to me, he whispered in my ear and said, this guy going to be one of the best in the world. I said, how the fuck you know? He said, because I know. And you know what? Yes, if there's somebody those days, I play with Phil. Phil still intimidate me. He's still very good. I mean, if you ask me, oh, yeah, can you feel compared to Doug Pock of today or to this? I don't know. I know about the Phil that played until eight years ago, or whatever, six years ago, when he, he was really on top of his game. Now, mostly he's playing in Macau and stuff, but he's definitely out there, the, over there on the top for me. Uh, you mostly want to know about the No Limit. And I don't know, I can ask you, what did you see on the No Limit when you watch the high stakes and you compare it to these days? I mean, you probably watch every high stakes. They I did. It, very easy, right? Easy games at the beginning? The games looked really good in the beginning. There were some guys, you know, I'm I'm partial to some people because of the influence that they had on me. And, you know, the Galfons, I, I was Brian Townsend when he played on high stakes poker. I remember was, I played with him too. Yeah. That was like a different level. I, I like, it felt like he was just on his game and was just a massive, massive favorite with the, his level of confidence and his ability. And when I think back to high stakes poker, uh, that's a name. I, I don't even know if SB rugby plays poker anymore. But I just remember watching him and thinking, fuck, that dude is good. Like that, <laughs> that dude is a killer. I think I remember. I remember when Phil Galfon sent, and I will remember when he said, and Doyle turned to me to my ear and said, do you know this guy? I said, no. <laughs> and we, di- we didn't even know the guy. We didn't know where they came from. Oh, definitely natural. I mean, you can see people that study. I mean, Phil Galfon knew what he's doing. I remember Phil Galfon folded to me. I think I have kings and I flap kings full. And I tried to trap him. And I even bet, checked twice and bet small on the river and he folded the full house. 
You know, he folded something that, it was ridiculous. And then I realized they either they read on me or, you know, because I definitely, I did what a lot of people do in old school, go home, recording it. Back then it was like two, three months later they put it on. And I tried, I really tried to watch the Tom Duan. Tom Duan make me talk to myself in this show sometimes and watch other people. And I did pick up some stuff on Sammy Faha. You know, the way he played, the way he played with his cigar, and never pick up anything on Tom Duan. Tom Duan make you crazy. And Tom Duan, I tell everybody to these days, he made hundreds of thousands of kids crying or parents crying because everybody want to do the Tom Duan to bet the slow motion, put ah. his chips and do this and, and bluff you. He bluffed me at least 10 times for good part and I lay good hands and, and you just don't know. I mean, so the Tom Duan and the, the, the um, I mean, Brian Townsend and Phil Galfon, and then I th- remember that uh, even, uh, uh, what his name, um, came to, get to the game and he tried to bluff Phil Ivey. Uh, sc- um, he just have two kids and he retired basically with a big beard. I just say his name a second ago. <laughs> I can't think Miami, of Miami from, from, Philadelphia, from Philadelphia. Oh, Mercier. Mercier, yeah. yeah. So you remember the hand? He tried I don't... to bluff Phil Ivey for about $100,000 and Phil Ivey right away in, in the high stakes. And those people did have a different game. They wanted to come in and they got famous on those games. But uh, I mean, the game was easy because I didn't try to make an hero moves over there, you know? I try to come and play. I never consider myself as a high stakes. I told, I said in the last shot to Ramco that playing four years ago, seven years ago, I would say, in the Bahamas, I play. I went to play the the Poker Stars uh, International PCA, yeah, PCA, and then uh, I didn't have a lot of money, so I wanted to play the twenty five thousand. So I went to Sean Dib, and I said to Sean, "You want to take a piece of me?" And he didn't want to laugh at my face. But he literally, he said, let me give you one tip, Eli. He took me inside. He said, you cannot win this game. The 25,000 is a super high level, and it's all young kids, and they know. I mean, and only back then I got introduced to the GTO, the, the game through, that I, that stuff that, and you know what? In a way, it's like insult, but I think that it sink to me. Because since then, you know how many people ask me, how come you don't play the million dollar? I'll come in. First of all, I don't have the money. But then, even I have the money, why would I play in a game that I feel I'm a dog? It's like I would ask you, you know, would you go to the, tomorrow to play in a game that I put the five big pro that playing every day in Bellagio? And, you know, I don't, maybe you said, yeah, because I like the no, challenge. No, no. Yeah, I, I would not say yes. I mean, that just seems like suicide to me. Exactly. And I see night in and night out. And you know what I do once in a while? You will, it's funny, but I can see when somebody is coming with somebody very special. So they come in starting locking seats. So I come and put my chip and I lock a seat. And then within 10 minutes, somebody walk in that they all was waiting, you know, they have a, you know, they grueling down and they, and yes, the guy that coming usually lose a hundred, two hundred thousand. So I'm trying to take my chances once in a while on those games. But even then, you know, when you know you're playing with six pro and only one fish, it's not as good, you know. I don't think I can, I can stand in your game, in your 24 day. I need to do a really big switch in my head to try to come and play no limit only those days. Yeah, it the doesn't make sense. Like, different. I, I think, like, it doesn't make sense for you to even try to do that just because, like, you have a skill in playing the mixed games that is extremely, extremely valuable and that, I've noticed just over the years, like I, I've told this story about people in the commerce, what they would do was they have a big whale that we're playing against. And then all of a sudden they pull them to the side and then they're playing like a three game mix with the whale with like deuce to seven and some other games. Yeah. And the specialists are kind of just like longingly looking at them playing shorthanded with the <laughs> whale. And it's like, okay, like, that's a very good move by whoever did that. And, you know, when you can play these mixed games that there's just a lot less information available out there on how to play them very, very well, that just means that there's a natural massive edge and hold them. 
for as fun and complex and intricate and as much as I love Hold'em, there is a ton of information on how to play very well at a high level. And so the more information that gets out there, it's just the natural edge just kind of diminishes over time. And you play a game, it's like Doyle, right? Like Doyle, you could invent a game, Doyle's going to play it at a high level because he understands poker and he understands the things that are going on. Um, and, and that's just a skill that is worth its weight in gold in this world. I mean, uh, you know, several interviews that I have with NBC and this, and I said, I'm going to die in a poker table. And, you know, it's one of the sentences that you just, what you just mentioned, I just love it. When you have it now, and when I'm doing good with it at the moment, you know, my mix game I'm doing good with, and I'm not, I would tell you that by now I'm managing myself really good, because when I see that that's it, I cannot win that day, you know, sometime, or when I lose one or two bullets that I give myself, I'm getting up. It took several years. It took many years for me to learn and a lot of hits. But uh, finally, that's all what I do now, you know. That's all what I do. I play only poker, and I'm happy with it. And, and matter of fact, while talking to you, I see Crazy Mike just text me, game at 6 p.m. today, <laughs> and that will be my third time playing since the pandemic, you know, so I'm so happy. Yeah, c- congratulations. Look, I totally get it. You feel like being a lone wolf in your poker journey has hamstrung your ability to realize your full potential. So I'm about to give you a golden opportunity to plug into a supportive tribe that will be the poker family you've always wished you had. How much money would you give for one hour of interactive group coaching led by myself, Coach Thomas, and occasionally past guests of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast? For now, and this will absolutely change at some point in the near future, the price of admission to the Live Poker Power Hour is 100% free. All you've got to do to get your invite is head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com and hop on the VIP newsletter. No more excuses, no more procrastination. It's time to take action and put yourself in position to turn your poker dreams into reality. I hope to see that beautiful face of yours in just a couple of days. We're human beings, and and I think that 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 gets lost on many people. Human beings are born with emotions, and like emotions are temporary and transient. And like you know, you mentioned that feeling of driving home when you lost over a million, and looking at yourself in the mirror and feeling the shame and the regret, and I'm probably some inner hatred, and like just you felt like an idiot. On the flip side of that what you said when you won like 1.8 million, you were the king, you were the king of the world, untouchable, bulletproof. And like, that's just the human experience are these in poker. It's extreme highs where you're a genius and extreme lows where you don't even know if you can spell the word poker anymore. And somehow or another, as time passes, you just kind of forget how it feels to be super low. Um, You you listen to, Listener also have to understand that I was fortunate enough because I own businesses. Mm -hmm. So when I got a big loss like that, I didn't have any money left. And if I borrow, I had to return. So I had to sit home. One time I sat home for six months. Six months I couldn't play and I couldn't empty up because I didn't have money. And I need to build myself to just to catch up, you know. And talking about a guy like you, a poker player, or a guy like, let's say, Chow or Jennifer Harman, or when that's all what you do. Now, those, I mean, Jennifer Harman got, got some stocks investment and stuff, so she cannot go. But some people, that all what they do is poker. And tomorrow they go broke. And they don't have a parents to go ahead and uh, let them. They have to start from the beginning. And people, the listener have to understand, beginning is micro stock. You have to start playing dollar, two dollars. And over there, you, you don't have power. Your money is not power because you cannot bluff. If you buy for $200 and the tourist sit in front of you and you see on TV that Ace King is a good hand, it doesn't matter. He'll push everything and uh, then he put his sunglasses on, you know, <laughs> try to look like on TV. And, and it's very, very tough to start from the beginning and to be, build yourself up to go to play the 5, 10, 10, 20 or 20, 40. I can see the levels in Bellagio. You can see the small one that you 
buy-in is 100 to 200 dollars, then the five and 10, the 500 buy-in. And then I can see, when I look at the faces, I can see some people that, and you can, you probably can agree on that. You have a handful, you don't have many people that make living from poker. No. And the one that you know, the top pro that make a living for poker, they definitely know what they're doing and they definitely been around. And because uh, there's a lot of poker players that thought that they're good, but they gone as they come in. Like, like we see on the tournament. Look at the tournament. Like, uh, you see one name and then he disappeared. You don't see him again. I mean, we see the Michael Mizrahi and the Daniel and those, a lot of names that been there for so long and you know they are good. You know that Chino is so good. You know that, you know, so many good names that I'm telling you. I mean, for my opinion, one of the best one, as much as I have, you know, some history with Sean Deeb. You know, I love Sean Deeb, but he's, he's one of the natural players today. He's so good. He's so good in the mixed game. He's so good in no limit. And we're going to see a lot of him, you know? In, a lot of him. Yeah, it's it, it takes a special kind of person to have a long career in the poker space. And, you know, you mentioned people disappearing. I mean, just in my career that started in 2004, I guess so 17 years I've been playing poker professionally. Well, you are the moneymaker boy. Yeah, yeah, of course. All right. <laughs> I, I was a moneymaker boy. Believe it or not, I, I watched Rounders before Moneymaker. Um, and a f- my friend who I, I bluffed and talked about a little earlier, uh-huh. uh, he was playing poker back on Paradise Poker, like in the late 90s. So I did have some level of interaction with poker. Like I knew that it was out there. And then uh, my friend actually wanted, or he got like 28th in a tournament at Foxwoods and drove through where I was living and working as a, a waiter. And he showed me like his little printout of like, he won $2,400. And I was like, holy shit, you won $2,400. Like, that's amazing. And he was telling me about playing poker. And that was sort of, that was when the bug no, bit, bit you me. You were underage. Because now I put in my hand real quick. Yeah, I was 19. You, seven. you play 18. He was 18 when you played in 2004. Or 19 you were. I was 19. I was 19 when I first started. I, I moved out. Where, where can you play in, when you're 19? You can go to cruises to nowhere down it <laughs> off Cape, Cape Canaveral in Florida um, to oh, the okay, okay, yeah. international that... waters. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean. What when, your parents thought about it when you start? Um, I would say. You, you my, straight from college or what? Or you drop? No, I, I I did not like school. I I never liked I never liked going to school. I was bored. I just couldn't stand it. And so I I took a year off. The the year off, um, which has now lasted almost twenty years. It's a very long year. And <laughs> found poker. And I, I I don't really know what my parents thought. To be honest, I can't. I know my grandparents had a lot of reservations because poker wasn't. I mean, even today, poker is stigmatized. But back then, it was even more stigmatized. And I, just, I, I don't know. I, I'm very – whenever I get my mind set on something, that's what I'm going to do. And so really, it didn't matter what anybody said. Like, that was my path. But um, after Black Friday, I, I'll never forget. I went to Commerce. I was sitting there playing the 10-20 game. And a bunch of young kids after online poker disappeared. And sitting there battling, we start talking and – about online poker, like revealing our screen names to each other. And um, I realized that like four of the guys I was playing against were regulars that I battled against online, like all the time. And after that trip, I never saw any of them again. Like that was the last time that I saw any of those online guys playing live poker. I don't know what happened to them. I don't, I guess they, they never played live poker before because I started playing on the cruises to nowhere. So I, I had experience playing face to face and I love playing face to face. You mean the, the very first card player poker cruise or what was it? Yeah. When I first started playing poker on the cruise. Is this like, the one that Gus won? No, 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 no. This is. Uh, oh, okay. I thought you're talking about card player cruises. No, then, no, no. This you. was like a daily. They just go, go out to international oh. waters. You gamble wow. four hours. They come back. <laughs> Um, uh, that, that sort of deal, but yeah, those guys, they disappeared. I, I don't know what happened to them, but lots of people I think disappeared after black Friday. I mean, it takes a special kind of person to not 
to not go broke over an extended period of time mm-hmm. in this game. Yeah, that's very tough at the beginning. Uh, and now I guess you're doing it on a regular basis you're playing, huh? Oh man, Ellie, what a, what a loaded question for me. Um, <laughs> I've, I started the podcast. I'm starting my business. I'm coaching. I'm creating stuff. I'm learning how to sell, be a copywriter, make sales pages. Uh, my community is almost 300 people. And mm. honestly, I, I want to play more, except like an off day for me is seven or eight hours of doing just various things. So wow. I haven't gotten an I haven't gotten a chance to play. Um and I think that my hope is that after building my business and getting things streamlined, I'll be able to kind of take a step back and be less involved, but this first few years, man, is just a lot of work, a lot of work. Well, let me see. Uh, you only 18, 22, 20. You only 32 now, 33? Oh no, 37 if my math. 37. My math. So when you get to 60, Yeah. You have enough time to cash all your <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll be able to play and just have fun playing. I, that's Enjoy that's the dream, thing. Ellie, is to own my own business and, you know, go broke and still have money, still <laughs> have a, a plan. You know, I can talk to Mori, put you on a high stakes uh, cash game coming up. Yeah, well, that would that would most likely lead me to going broke. <laughs> <laughs> I just... don't think so. Lose I think a couple buy ins. Put you in one of those Jeff Platt, he put in. I saw some lines up and stuff. I think you can make money. I'll be happy to take 50% of you. In <laughs> one of those. It's only, I think, 10,000 buy in or 20. And it, the lineup is amazing. And all what you have to do is do what you do play ABC poker and enjoy yourself. And I think you can make money, even though me and you know that it doesn't matter how good you're playing. If one hand go, not going correctly, if you have aces, you can go broke. But. This is our game. I, I, would very, I would take you up on that in an instant. Um, that, well, that... Did you interview Mori yet? No, I haven't. Okay, then I, I can, when we finish, I'll send you Mori's phone number. You text him, tell him that you want him on a Chasing a Greatness. And, a, and I think that he'll be a very good... Tell him Eli said he should come and a, he called me Eli also. <laughs> and he, should come, he should come and be on your show. Because he have also the best stories. He is the poker history. He's a good poker ambassador. He's the poker go guy. And uh, oh, yeah, he's actually producing poker go. So then it'll be good advertising for him and everything. So, and then uh, he got in, he'll get introduced to another fish in his games. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that um, after, after we close up shop. Okay. in just a few minutes and you know if you don't mind let's let's hit the lightning round and we can sure. we can hit it and then you can start preparing to go play some mixed games for uh-huh. the third time <laughs> in the past year yeah. um let's see here so when you think of pots that you've won in your poker career what's the first pot that comes to mind i play a pot with the uh... I played several of them in high stakes poker, but a pod that haven't been recorded was me, Lyle, and Gus. Play a pod with them that uh, I, uh, I have the 19 and a half to these days, my favorite hand. And uh, Lyle have the two nines and Gus have the nut heart. And we playing, it was 1,000, 2,000. And usually the raise was to 7,000. And I think I won 700 and some thousand in this particular hand. All three of us, us make the hand. I mean, the flop was the 7-8, you know, 7-8 a heart. And the, no, the, sorry, Lyle, Lyle, uh, Lyle had two eights, yeah. So he flopped the top set, 3-7-8. The turn came a jack a heart, so that's why I make my straight flush. And Gus make his nut flush. And back then, we all, the cap was only 200,000. So it was bet, I just call, gas raise, and he raise, and he did, all what he have to do is I have to put my money. <laughs> yeah. They were drawing dead. And just don't have a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, that's a memorable end, definitely. I have a few of them that, uh, uh, the famous one that I flopped for aces, 
everybody else will check, and I didn't check. I bet into the pot, and Sammy Faha moved me all in. He didn't <laughs> have much money behind him. But me and Sammy Faha had some history. And uh, I mean, you know, playing... I'm not like Doyle. Doyle literally remember him that I played with him 20 years ago. 20, 15 years, he said, oh, you remember that you have the quad and I have this? I said, how the heck you remember those? <laughs> he said, that's something in my system that I cannot take. He remembered those things. I tell people that a lot of those hands that I don't remember because is, uh, I'm playing stud and I love stud. My next bracelet I'm going to win is going to be in stud again. I want two in stud, one stud either better and one in, in deuce to seven triple draw. Next one going to be, because I love stud and I think my age on other player in stud, I never miss bets. And I, so I remember people said, why you don't remember? Because I need to remember what came out on the table. <laughs> If you play with me stud, I can tell you 10 and later what came, what is the cards that was exposed. Jack a club, do a diamond, whatever. So I remember that. And it's very important to this game, to my game. And then also at the same time, I play the player mostly, you know, in stud and, uh, People think poker player love stud. Old school poker, poker player all love stud. Because it's a one winner. It's not a split game, you know. And you definitely have some talent in there, you know. Some yeah. skills. So, I mean, made other major hands that I remember. Probably I was in the bottom on the, on the losing end of yeah, them. Yeah, that, that's the follow-up question is the, the most memorable pot that, that you've lost. I think if I... Oh, man, I... This is like the yeah, lamest, la- la- lamest joke that I was going to make. But in Super System, you know, you talked about Doyle and he, I was going to say, if I remember correctly, he calls it recall, like that ability of high level poker players to just recall a specific hand and really remember the granular details to the point um, of each hands. And for the first five years of my career, that was how I operated. Um, and then at some point, I, I don't know, it just... They started going out of my mind. I just started letting them go. It was like I was holding on to them forever, and I, I eventually just let them go. But recall, certainly, I mean, it's certainly a skill that you're probably just born with. Um, I don't know that that can be taught as it relates to... No, I, I can okay. tell you that I can memorize a few hands. The, the set over set that you literally have the one out and you want to cry. That, <laughs> and I did eat a couple of them, the one out. But, uh, you know, I... I'm not the guy that will meet you in the in the hallway in a World Series of Poker and give you the bad beats. Because I said to people, you know, so many of them will try to stop you and, and you can't hear it anymore, especially old school, because it's this is our life. This is bad beats. But I won't cry too much about bad beats because I give a lot more than I'm taking, you know, <laughs> because I have a lot more imagination than other people. And that's it. That's the way I look at it. I don't. You get so many people that cannot take it, you know? All the, and then they start get smoke going out of the ear. And, and of course, you can see it on the table. And you saw it on the table that you play with an with amateur cash game player. Once he lost with his aces or he flopped top set and he lose with it, you know he's going to play the next hand. There is no doubt. The next hand, the next one after that. And then that's why you, we are uh, the vultures waiting for them, you know? We, can, we, we read the emotion. Mistake. Yeah, we, we read the emotion. We, we feel the desperation. I think Phil Locke put it to my friend. This was many years ago at Commerce. And he was, Phil Locke was getting drunk while he was playing high stakes poker with my friend. And Phil Locke told my friend, like, man, you know, the difference between like mid six figures and seven figures a year playing this game is like the poker, the pro player's ability to just recognize when a player's heart is just open, exposed and bleeding all <laughs> over the felt. And just love stabbing him, you know, through the heart with a dagger. Oh, I like, love it. And... I love it. The way I love to play with Phil Luck on high stacks. I mean, mm-hmm. and now with I love playing with Jennifer. I mean, Jennifer is a lot of action now. You know, she played with me, I think the last four or five times, Poker After Dark, I play with Jennifer. And uh, I like to give action to people that are giving action, you know. And when you see it's a guy sit down forever and folding ace king like Phil Almud did in there, then you don't give him a lot of action, you know? Try not to give him a lot of action because there's no reason that you'll be the one, you know, with this famous rounder. 
if you sit around the table, you don't see him, it's me, it's you. <laughs> yeah, and you, you got to give to get. And that's just, you know, a thing that I was just now talking about as it relates to edge and uh, guys that drive me crazy are the people that like move seats whenever a tough player sits down on their left or there's an empty seat and they see them moving over. It's like, man, I, I have too much pride to let anybody know that I'm afraid to move a seat. Like I'll take the worst of it right now because fuck it. I'm not going to let that guy know that I'm scared of him being on my <laughs> left. Like I'm just going people to sit there. And the point that I don't agree with you. Right here, Brad. <laughs> I really don't. I think that Dole hate it. Doyle made a rule in our game, you cannot move seats. Mm-hmm. So, and because, listen, I move seats in my game, and I'm not ashamed to say it, not because I want to take position on the fish on the table or the guy that play most of the hand, because I'm running bad. And when you're running bad, the way that the dealer deal the card or the way the way, it's, it's working. Many well, times I was stuck, let's say, 20, 30. I moved to another seat and things stopped changing. So you don't want me to believe on it? And I would tell you, bite Bite your tongue and bite your pride. And if for some reason you think that this man playing a seven or eight out of ten hands, and uh, and it's definitely gonna hold you. He put put you in the cuffs. You know, you definitely take a position. It's your money. It's I it's mean, more for me. I, I know what you're getting, and I I totally under. It makes all the logical sense in the world. Like I will move seats from like the one and the nine because they're just annoying to be in the one and the nine. <laughs> But mm-hmm. it's more if if a player's moving from a must move and I know they're a great player and people start changing seats and stuff. For yeah. me, I just I, I'm not gonna move I, like I'm not gonna be the fourth person that moves just so this guy finds a different seat. I like, see what he's saying. That yeah, part you, of it for me forget fourth. But if you're the f- one to move, it's okay to move, nothing is wrong if it's not working for you. That's my point. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If it's not like for all the other reasons. Moving seats, totally fine. Just when a, a good player is coming in, I'm not going to jump across the table just so that they don't sit down next to me. I think that's that was my my major point. Um, yeah, this is a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you could gift all poker players one book to read, this is your this is your time to shine, Ellie. Um, of course, what book if would it's it in be? mine, it's unfair. <laughs> pulling the trigger, or in Hebrew, I get that poker it is, but. It's mine, but this is not much about poker. I mean, I would definitely start with the with the Ace and the River with Barry Greenstein, and then I go to to Mike Saxton's book is the most amazing. Now, if you want to really read about being how to play poker and being professional, there's so many books on it. Dan Errington, I heard, is really, really good, but I haven't read it. And I think they should ask people like you, because you probably meet read more books you know i didn't read a lot of book in uh, about the game for me poker books don't really do it for me anymore i'm more i like videos i like courses i like I, i'm an experiential learner like i've never I, it's hard for me to learn i think that's why i hated school i want to do like i want to experience something you can explain a game to me and it doesn't make sense but as soon as i see people playing it and i'm like touching and feeling then it just all kind of clicks in my head so i love stories um, but books are not my preferred method of but then, learning. Then, I mean, you the videos. Go ahead and watch the best players in the world playing. I mean, make notes even, what they're playing. Look at the mistake they're making and try to remember that. Of course, they would tell you not every situation is the best, but I, when I was watching the film of High Stakes Poker, I tried to remember when I play against certain player, what did he do in certain situation? And he did walk. I won't tell you walk 90% of the time, but even 50% of the time for us is big. You know, when they, I did my shot now and they told me it's 95, I said, how many times you see me out of 20 times going all in? For me, I'm <laughs> so happy now that, <laughs> that I'm 95% uh, safer, but I've been watching myself really good during this time, so it doesn't matter. So... Yeah, watch a lot of film. Watch a lot of those good players. And don't watch the heads up. Heads up matches between Antonio and Phil Almut or Doug Pock and Danny. It's not poker. I'm sorry, but it's not poker. Sooner or later, when you make the heads, make the heads up to win a bracelet, yes, you need to know and you need to know how many heads. But watch the full games. And when you watch full game, especially the one we're playing, the cash game and not tournament, 
Because in cash game, you can reach and buy again. In tournament, you cannot. So watch those and try to remember and try to, I mean, people like uh, Chino, people like uh, Michael Mizrahi, people don't understand. Uh, they they thinking that they, those guys have the, you know, the high blood and they're playing with the most. Those guys are so good, you know. Chino is a paradox of a human being that I don't even know how to describe. I've only played against him a couple of times. And the few times I've played with him, he's been like playing PLO and like potting it in the dark every hand with like not a care in the world. I, I <laughs> He's sort of a paradox of like just gambler, um, just total gambler. And then also amazing, amazing skill of playing poker. Like it's, it's a weird... I don't even know how to quantify Chino. Well, I tell you what, in 2008, eight, nine, I was finally full tilt came to the air. And, you know, I was one of full tilt pro and I got good money from them and everything. And I remember talking to our that to put the mix game and he put the horse and I, I was doing good. And I think I won the database show that I won about $5.8 million in horse. And again, I feel so good, you know, because people, I play with Tom Duan horse and he cannot beat me, you know? So, and then I decided to my stupid reason, I play Zygmunt, I play Tom Duan, and I play Isidore, and I play some of those guys, PLO. And don't worry, I thought, oh, PLO is so simple. You have to <laughs> aces, aces, double suited. And then I didn't understand. I finally get the hand and I three bet them and they four bet me and I five bet them. And I didn't understand that the 10 Jack Queen King double suited or the six, seven, eight, nine. I didn't understand that I'm even money. Or, I mean, or if I have bad aces, they are favorite. Don't worry. I lost every profit that I make in my mix game to those guys. And again, those those are the school that you have. And a lot of listeners have to understand. You can save those uh, painful uh, lessons by watching a lot of things. And I mean, nobody, no one is safe in PLO. I mean, you'll be playing good, but you play PLO and we know. We know, but uh, if, especially if you play open. It's Even a different play, game. It, like, if you play cup PLO, then you're safe. If you play open, nobody's safe. <laughs> it, it's just a different game, and the equities run much closer together, like you said, and folding out equity is like a major part of it, and it's just a different It's just a different beast than like Hold'em or the other games. I mean, you've got to put in the time, the energy, and actively try to learn. Like, they're... they're there's a way to create massive, massive, massive edges in PLO. Okay, well, our rapid fire questions. Uh, sometimes okay. they, they don't go so rapid fast. Uh, and that's, okay. I, I blame myself. Um, I put the blame on me. If you could wave a magic wand, change one thing about poker, what would it be? Sunglasses, Udi, and the, <laughs> and the time of no limit players. I don't need the, the things. I want every game to have the 30 second clock. Oh my God. You are speaking my language, Ellie. Like that, every that's game. why i I hate tournaments. I can't do it. Exactly. I, my Doyle blood pressure. Exactly. You know, Brett, that's what Doyle told me. The reason he stopped playing tournament is because this, everybody thinks that he's on TV. Now I'm talking about before the flood. I'm talking about just waiting. Why would you have to think 45 seconds before you fold your hand for a regular uh, coming in, you know, and that's destroyed the no limit. And I know that uh, Matt Savage tried, and I know that uh, uh, WPT trying now, and I played the WPT champion uh, championship, only the champion, and we, they give us the six or eight, uh, you know, time clock, and I love it. You make your move, boom, she push, 30 seconds. You make move, push. I mean, game is quick, 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 and you got to be good enough to do it. I just, if you have to lose some of those stuff, do it. I mean, of course, there is some decision for all your money. So it's okay. Lose some of those, uh, you know, chips for the time. Yeah, I've, I've talked with Matt Savage about that as well. And the problem with tournaments is that stalling is incentivized, especially as you get near the bubble. You make money by stalling and not playing fast. And in cash game, it's the opposite. You make more money because you play more hands. So exactly. your goal is to play the next hand always. So you act quickly. And until you can change the incentive or take away the incentive of stalling to give you an edge, tournaments will just be super slow. I and wonder I, if they ever ugh. change it completely. I, 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 it's hard to me to believe, but it might be one day that 
will be this machine that shuffled the card might be one that automatically you'll have the time clock on it. I hope so. And what I ultimately hope for is that they penalize people for taking too long. They start taking chips out of play Ooh, that's from the amazing. players. Amazing uh, idea. Good idea. <laughs> yeah, let's punish the short stacks. They take too long. They can get automatically eliminated by stalling near the bubble. <laughs> um, if you could erect a billboard, every poker player's got to drive past on the way to the casino. What does your billboard say? Keep loving poker. <laughs> <laughs> Love the game. Never, never go broke. Uh, manage. Make That's the decisions. Good. Yeah. yeah. Make good decisions. Um, ha- have you ever strongly believed something about poker only to reverse course later on? And if so, what led to that change? I, it's, it's a very strong question, but uh, I have to dig into my memory to see if I have some stuff that uh, probably keep poker and family apart. Because uh, when I start playing, you know, with kids at the house, I used to bring my motion and people used to see it on me. If I have a bad day or I got knocked out of the tournament, I was very edgy. So I came in and I uh, I blew up when I wasn't supposed to, if it's about the wife or the kid. And yes, I would definitely be able, those days I will change it. She, they don't know. The last 20, 15, 20 years, nobody knows. And I don't tell nobody, no, my wife, no. How did you do in poker? They can't tell. I mean, I have this poker face, and that's it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, yes, if the, the, the listener that's starting games, try to keep the emotion and try to keep whatever you do on the table to yourself, maybe. So it's very hard, but it's a, it's something that will help you to manage to go keep going and love poker, you know? It's a weird thing that happens when people sweat me. Like, if I'm by myself... I am almost never steaming. I, I'm just like calm, cool, collected, just grinding and playing. When somebody sweats me and like some things start going bad, and I, it, I get more emotionally affected. And I've, <laughs> wow. I've, I've always recognized it, but I, I can't really put it into words or understand why other than when shit's going really bad, I guess the expectation from the outside is to feel upset. And if you feel like, if you're acting like nothing's wrong, maybe they think that, or maybe I'm just picking up on the emotions that they're feeling. I don't know, but it's a thing. So that you like, imagine that somebody sweat you. You imagine when you play high stakes or poker, everybody sweat you. Yeah. So if you make, you make the wrong move or you don't bet when you're supposed to, and you know that your opponent will get out, everybody watch you. Oh, so that's, is- that's totally different. Like I, I've, I play poker on stream. I make training videos and everybody sees exactly what I'm doing. It's yeah. different than when it's like a close friend. That's why I don't know why when they're just like over your shoulder in the moment, <laughs> it's a, it's a different kind of, you know, they don't allow you to sweat now. Really? No, yeah. I didn't know that. Bellagio and Arie, you cannot bring a sweater. What happened? I guess they're because they've COVID. Only because COVID. Oh, because we of COVID. We are not allowed yeah. to eat. We are not uh, allowed to eat either in the table. Yeah. You're allowed to drink if you order food. And you know, we high stack people. You take your food and go outside to eat in the, the certain tables there, you know? Yeah. So no the more lunch. trays <laughs> pushing around. So you have nothing to worry about somebody sweating you soon, so. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't worry about it. It's just a thing that I've noticed. And it hasn't happened in a while because nobody sweats me anymore. Right. So maybe maybe it's a thing that only happened 10 years ago and it, it's not a big deal now. <laughs> but um, okay, so two more questions and we'll get you out of here. Yeah. What's a project you're working on right now that's near and dear to your heart? A, no project that I'm working on right now. At the moment, I'm trying to concentrate how do I go back to the old days and uh, play poker five, six days a week. And I'm holding my finger crossed that uh, what uh, Kevin Matt just wrote on his Twitter that uh, he talked to one of the top uh, top uh, CEO on, on World Series of Poker and we, they would have a live event. And mm-hmm. uh, this year, and maybe they're shooting for September, I don't know. My hope that... Uh, They'll have what the Israel, Israeli people do. They'll have a green passport. Because we have right now a card that showed that I took the first shot and second shot. In Israel, they give you a green passport. It said that you've been vaccinated. 
So my hope that if you want to come tomorrow and sign for a tournament in World Series or any place, you don't have this green passport, you cannot sign. Because I don't want this guy to come from Rome, Italy, or Paris, France, and I'm not sure if they've been vaccinated or if they were sick and they're touching the same chips. And we obviously going to have to learn how to live with those those days now. And uh, we don't want anybody else to get hurt. So if World Series of Poker will do that and WPT will do that, I will be very happy. That yeah. Will be the stuff that, uh, Me too. And Vegas, I mean, it's a destination. People come in from everywhere bringing from the airports and God only knows what, right? Like it's right. all it takes is one person and a group of people to affect many, many lives. And I hope, I hope you're right. I hope they do play it safe and be smart. And there's a lot of incentive and a lot of money to be made by playing it smart. So right. hopefully they just get it done. And the final question, Ellie, yes, where can the chasing poker greatness audience find more about you and read your book on the World Wide web. Well, uh, Amazon got my book against pulling the trigger. People ask why pulling the trigger because they, Matan Krakow, they wrote it. He decided to, to make it. I was in the Israeli army and I was got killed in Lebanon. And pulling the trigger is from the army and late Max Saxton in a poker, in Mirage Poker Showdown, the very last hand, I have ace queen of suit and Lee, uh, I raise, uh, he raised me, I two bet, uh, Two bet, then uh, no, he, he raised, I re raised his three bet, and then uh, he, he moved me all in. Sorry, the fourth bet, and then uh, Mike Saxton said, Would Ellie Lazar pull the trigger? Would he pull the trigger? Would he call? Because he had a million, he, he moved a million and a half with four or five in Spain. And I was it Lee Markold? I, I can't even remember. Yes. It was Lee Markold? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't and, remember. And that I won then. my first million dollar tournament, so that's why we call it. So, yeah. If they want to hear about it, it's definitely there. This is the book that I wrote about everything in my life. And uh, uh, everyone that ever come to Bellagio, to Bobby's room or Ivy's room in Aria, I'll be very happy to take picture and to sign my book and to do whatever they need. Awesome, Ellie. Thank, thank you very much for your time, your stories. I'm very, very grateful. And um, best of luck going back to the world of poker. And hopefully things coming back to normal over the next six, yes, six to 12 months. Yes, appreciate you having me. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Good day. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.